Gaddafi. Muammar Gaddafi uh, came to power in uh, 1969 in a coup overthrowing uh, a monarchy there, King I Idris. Uh, one of the first things he did, which endeared him to the international left and revolutionaries everywhere, mm -hmm. was to throw out the huge American military base, Wheeler Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. uh, and Gaddafi quickly evolved into a classic post-colonial uh, state. Libya evolved into a post-colonial state. We saw that in Egypt, uh, we saw it in Iraq, we saw it in other countries where nationalist leaders came out of the military. So they really had no organic connection to the population. They had, they had, their allegiance was to their own military. And so these national security states uh, were built up, uh, you know, primarily uh, in, this, in a, adopting a stance of, of uh, opposition to colonialism and imperialism of the, of the old style, uh, not co totally grasping the new phase of imperialism and colonialism, not replicating uh, the British and the French and the Dutch mm. and the Belgians, but a new phase of uh, colonialism. And in some instances, in Gaddafi's case, actually in the 80s, uh, in the 90s, excuse me, uh, actually cooperating uh, with Washington, buying huge amounts of arms uh, from the French and the Germans. Uh, you know, they love to sell weapons uh, as well. If they can ever, you know, push a U.S. contract aside, uh, they're very anxious to. Now, I know this is now the new uh, rationale for imperial interventions, responsibility to protect. Yeah. This is, this is a new, this is, a, there is no such thing in law, either in civil law or in international law. An absolute fabrication and concoction of the Obama administration, which was looking for a reason to intervene uh, in Libya. Now, terrible things have happened in Libya, terrible. Several thousands of people have been killed, in prison, tortured. You know, there's no condoning that. But look what, uh, if you just recall this, the numbers I, I, I mentioned about Kashmir. Why isn't there any hue and cry in Kashmir, about Kashmir, which far exceeds the uh, human rights violations of Libya and even Syria, if, if, I, can, if I can say. So this, this again is a selective application of uh, moral virtue, of concern. We saw it in the Balkans in the 90s where all of a sudden we were concerned about people getting massacred. The, the uh, main rationale for the Obama, and this was a, a US directed NATO operation. NATO basically is now the French mm -hmm. Foreign Legion. It is a, an appendage to the Pentagon. It can be called upon to use when we want to tell the American people, well, it's not all of our money or all of our, all of our resources uh, being spent in Libya. NATO's doing a lot uh, as well. So this is the kind of fiction that's, that's going uh, forward. And I think it's very ominous for the future because uh, NATO is now not defending the North Atlantic, not defending Western Europe, but has become an international player. What is it doing in Afghanistan? That is a NATO operation. NATO is operating way beyond its uh, borders. And of course, with the military industrial complex ever thirsting, ever uh, trying to slake its insatiable desire for avarice, for more and more profits, conflict is good for business. Peace is terrible for business. If peace breaks out, you can't sell weaponry. So there's almost an institutional push. That's what I want. That's what I was the point I was making about capitalism. Capitalism has institutional impulses and streams coursing through it that produce these kinds of upheavals on a regular basis, and I must say, on a more and more frequent basis. Howard Zinn would have been 90 uh, in August. I know you were a close collaborator with him and a dear friend. Brought out the towels for us. Yes, Howard Zinn, our dear comrade, and uh, who's been been to Santa Fe as well. Uh, he passed away on January twenty seventh, two thousand and ten, at the age of uh, eighty seven. Uh, a great, great man, and I think my voice is going to crack up. Mm -hmm. uh, I miss him terribly. He's such an inspiration, and I wish he were here today 
to see what was happening in the country. I, I have a quote that, that um, that's a long quote, but uh, uh, you guys want to read it? You want me to read it out loud? Yeah. You, David, yeah, you want to read it? Uh, Why don't you read it? I think I have that quote here as well. Do you really? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Do, do I have it? Well, Can you see from here? I can't, no. To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. <laughs> we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently. This gives us the energy to act, and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents. And to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is itself a marvelous victory. Right. Now, Howard Zinn is one of the you know, really beacons of uh, rationality and compassion. And he never lost a sense of humor. That was the great thing about uh, Howard, for those of you who knew him or had the privilege to hear him speak. He would always inject some levity into the most uh, dire uh, kind of uh, situation because he knew that was, it was very important uh, that people you know, not lose hope and not completely envelop uh, themselves in gloom and doom because it's easy to do. Objectively speaking, uh, things are pretty bad. They're worse than bad. Howard Beale, Network, 1976, Sidney Lumet. Uh, I was channeling Howard Beale in Denver the other day. And he's the one, the network anchor who goes bazonkers. You'll remember that. Howard, uh, Peter Finch played him. Faye Dunaway was in it, William Holden. Very interesting film. And he said, you know, things are bad. They're worse than bad. It's a depression. I'm not, and I want you to go now, to go out there and say I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And that's what's happening with this Occupy uh, Wall Street movement, which is mushrooming across the country. Uh, there were 1,500 demonstrations last Saturday <coughs> around the world, as well in Rome and Madrid, huge uh, demonstrations. Athens, people are pushing back. They're saying basta. They're saying no mas to neoliberalism, to privatization, to these economic fantasies of people like Hayek and Ayn Rand and uh, Alan Greenspan, who was referred to constantly as an oracle and the genius, you know, the maestro. In fact, that was one of his uh, 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 titles he was given. The maestro, he would you know, testify in front of the Senate Banking Committee or the Senate Finance Committee and saying, you know, There's no, the economy is just humming on all cylinders here, you know. Everything is hunky-dory. These people were living in a very narrow space and had no conception of what their economic policies were doing to people on the lower rung, rung of the economic ladder. We have seen, why are people in this country angry? It's very clear. We have seen in the last 30 years the greatest transfer of wealth from the bottom and the middle to the top in the history of probably the world, if this is the world's richest society. Uh, one could probably say that. There has been a massive transfer of wealth. Reaganomics, remember that? You remember Reagan in the early 19, 1980s? Don't worry about these tax cuts. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll generate revenues from other sources. What other sources? Uh, you know, punitive taxes, sales taxes, forcing states and municipalities to hit everyday people right in their pocketbook when they buy food and gas and basic necessities. So the, the the guiding slogan in the 80s was a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, you should relax. They didn't tell you one thing. The boats were all yachts. <laughs> and the rest of us were in canoes and rowboats, and we went right to the bottom. That's what happened starting in the 80s. And this has been a 30-year cycle now. And it's, people are saying enough of it. It's happening in the birthplace of, birthplace of democracy, Greece. And it's, it's spreading throughout Europe. Uh, and, of course, now in the United States. 
Citizen journalism. Citizen journalism. Uh, we need more of it. Because of social media define, now. Define, define, yeah, define it. Because of social media now, these, these, citizen journalism is journalism outside the corporate vector. So, you know, we're not being spoon-fed by uh, Murdoch or CBS or General Electric or any of the other big corporations that basically own the microphones and the cameras and, and the TV screens and, and have a tremendous uh, domination uh, historically uh, at record levels, but actually that's uh, uh, diminishing somewhat right now because of the growth of alternative media, because of the growth of social media. Uh, we've, we saw in North Africa, particularly uh, Facebook and um, Twitter and YouTube uh, being very, very important electronic interventions in getting news to people that is not being filtered through those traditional sources, like the Egyptian government, uh, for example, or Fox News here. So people are able to communicate immediately with an immediacy uh, that is unparalleled. They are on the spot. And so in my talk in Denver, I, I urged her, because there were a lot of young people there, I said, you are the journalists of the future with your, you know, with your Twitters, with, with your cell phone cameras, with your Facebook pages. You can create journalism. So that's a tremendous opening. It's a tremendous uh, uh, apertura to uh, new journalism, the kind that uh, will roll back the uh, incredible, incredibly fossilized <laughs> and uh, dead corporate journalism. Mm -hmm. the military industrial state, we touched on this already. I was referencing that, that Panetta article. Mm -hmm. The guy who's got a, he's not gonna get a blank check is what the article said. He's gonna have to cut $500 billion over the next five years. Uh, the military industrial complex has been driving uh, US uh, foreign policy uh, since the end of World War II. Uh, there was a very important document uh, that the State Department released uh, during the war, actually. By 43, it was clear that the U.S. was going to emerge victorious from the war. There was no way that Germany and Japan could possibly win. And along with that, uh, Britain and France, the old colonial powers, would also uh, be greatly weakened. And so the U.S. would emerge as the global superpower. And if you read this document, it is available, you can you know, Google it. Uh, it. It lays out clearly that uh, the US must control the energy resources of the world. The greatest strategic prize in the history of the world is, is how the Saudi and uh, Gulf and Iranian oil reserves are described. And the US intends to grab them, to keep them, to, to marginalize the British. The French were already pushed out. The British basically pushed the French out, and now the US was coming in to push the British out. So that was the, sh the framework for post-war um, uh, US power. Hegemony, destroy all nationalist movements, even if they were liberal democratic, like uh, the Arbenz regime in Guatemala, like Mossadegh in Iran, uh, like um, uh, Juan Bosch in the Dominican Republic. Numerous, multiple uh, national democratic regimes uh, were overthrown uh, by the US. Other countries were invaded uh, in order to impose this uh, global hegemony. And so the military industrial uh, complex has had its hand on, on the US throat uh, since the end of World War II. And it continues today with Boeing and Raytheon and Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and Honeywell and all of the other uh, weapons manufacturers that are making money hand over fist. While schools are being closed, while teachers are being laid off, while libraries are being closed, while, while librarians don't have money to buy books, while, while the hours are being cut back, you know, we are sending troops to Uganda. There's plenty of money for the military industrial complex. There's no money for, for us, for we the people. We are being marginalized in our own country. We're just being asked to turn out every four years and vote for this or that uh, you know, candidate for president and to go home. I think what Occup the Occupy movement shows is that elections are not the answer. Maybe on a local level, you c it, it, they are important. School board and that kind of thing, the city council, you can have an impact on a local level. On the national level, it's simply impossible because of the 
tremendous influence of corporate money that dominates the political system. So to think that you know someone is going to wake up in the White House one day, any president, uh, and say you know this is this is unjust. This system of uh, militarization, hundreds of bases overseas, of bombing people on site, of of uh, black sites, of uh, preventative detention, of deportations. This is that's not going to happen from any president. It's only going to happen when there's enough heat in the streets to make it so uncomfortable that then yes. Kennedy says we've got to have we've got to do something uh, for the civil rights movement of African Americans. It was only because of that pressure from below. Nothing came from the top. They're putting it off as much as and as long as they possibly can. So imperialism, we've got to we've got to get rid of it. That cannot be the central focus of U.S. foreign policy. We should be a compassionate country. We should be first in healthcare, first in the arts. First in education, the, the things that really matter, that make life worth living, not in cruise missiles and the latest drone technology, which is being developed at Kirtland Air Force Base at, at the Sandia Lab. I get late night texts often about uh, some relief pitching failure of the Yankees from David. Well, I, I, I always, I'm always for the underdog. So uh, in this case, I, I, I'm for the St. Louis Cardinals, and uh, you know, I hope they win. Uh, the World Series. But um, for those of you who don't know my own background, I was actually radicalized politically uh, by baseball because I was a dyed-in-the-wool Brooklyn Dodgers fan uh, in the 1950s. And uh, the Dodgers won the World Series in uh, 1955. They were bought by a banker. My loathing for banks and bankers started at a very early age. His name was Walter O'Malley. And he said, this was just a business deal. You know, I want to invest in the Dodgers, make it the best team, and uh, we're going to ha have a new stadium in New York. And you know, I was li listening to all of this stuff, and, and the mayor at the time was Robert F. Wagner, the son of a, a really great liberal New Deal politician, Robert F. Wagner, senator from uh, New York. His son was a shadow of uh, his father. And he was saying, the Dodge there were rumors going around the Dodgers are going to move to Los Angeles. And uh, the politicians, were, this is impossible. It's like moving the Brooklyn Bridge to Transylvania. You know, it's not going to happen. And then one day I wake up, you know, as a kid and say, New York, you know, Daily News headline, Dodgers move to LA. I was shocked. I mean, and that, that told me all I needed to know about capitalism, about loyalty, because O'Malley was, O'Malley was making plenty of money in Brooklyn. But he had, a, he had the opportunity to make a killing by moving to LA where the local politicians in Los Angeles raised one of the oldest Mexican uh, neighborhoods in Chavez Ravine to build at public cost a, a stadium for the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. So that radicalized me uh, politically. So sports, yeah, has a big impact. Things have only gotten better, though. Things have only gotten better? In terms of the sport, the sports and money. Well, it's, it's again, it's, it's become, it's become cor a cor another corporate. Right activity, another part of the corporatization of everything and the commodification of everything. Capitalism as, as an economic system has to deplete and loot the Earth's resources. It has no other choice as an economic system. That is raison d'etre. Now we can ask these corporations, you know, uh, be a little kinder, be a little gentler, but it doesn't change the fundamental identity of who and what they are because they are driven by an economic system that privileges profits over people and sees the earth as a commodity that must be harnessed. And, and you know that's uh, apocryphal, but it doesn't matter if it's apocryphal or not. Chief Seattle's quote uh, in the 1850s, he noticed among the white settlers then, this is in the 1850s, right? No Walmart, no Kmarts, no Sears. No, you know, Amazon, nothing. He saw that among the white people, there's an incredible desire uh, and thirst to accumulate goods, to, to have material wealth. And if this continues un, uh, unimpeded, sooner or later, the white man and the white woman will suffocate in the toxic waste of its own bed because they're putting those, that pollution right where they sleep. 
it's it's a it's an inspiring uh, statement, sad to say, and it's it's uh, it's it's veritas. It is it is truth. Ah, happy birthday! Twenty five years old. Seems like you're, you're somewhere around a uh, thousand shows now. Uh, I'm going to give you a list of some of the people who. Sorry, we're doing a little more business here. Uh, there we go. A list of the 430 odd people who have um, been on your show. A thousand. Some of them are getting cut off there. Do you see that? Uh, and over the course of 25 years, of course, you have uh, this vast production facility and. Your huge staff that helped you do it. Staff of two. Yeah. I urge you all to visit. When you come to Boulder, please visit me and see our Asparagus. capacious corporate headquarters. <laughs> uh, well over 300 square feet. In excess. Uh, we have daily tours. The bus goes around. You have to sign up in advance because tremendous demand. Do you remember recording your first show for Alternative Radio? The first show I did for Alternative Radio was an actual disaster uh, because uh, it was a talk that Noam Chomsky gave and no one told me that uh, you should uh, edit in 60 minute segments so I did a 90 minute segment which made it impossible for most stations to broadcast it because they didn't have those kinds of slots but fortunately a couple of Pacifica stations uh, did pick it up and uh, then uh, that was the beginning of alternative radio. And I must say there's a, a real connection between alternative radio and uh, New Mexico. Uh, Richard Wolf, I've done a couple of programs with him, recorded right here in Santa Fe. Chris Hedges, right here in Santa Fe. Uh, in Taos, uh, Howard Zinn. Um, I did an interview with John Sales, the great independent film director uh, in Santa Fe. Uh, yeah. All kinds of programs, Sut Jolly, uh, Danny Schechter, Naomi Klein. Naomi Klein and Avi Lewis. Avi Lewis, who's going to be interviewing um, Tariq Ali at the Lensic uh, this Wednesday. Uh, as of a couple of hours ago, there were five tickets left uh, to that event. I don't know if there are any left at this point. There are none left. Amazing. So, uh, Only in Santa Fe. Yeah. So there's a real connection. Uh, events in Albuquerque. I've recorded Chomsky there. Also in... Um, Chris Hedges uh, came to Taos, actually the very first program, War as an Addiction, I did with Chris Hedges, was recorded uh, in Taos. Uh, Robin Collier, who's here with Cultural Energy of uh, Taos, has sent me um, a number of programs, most recently Kathy Christensen, right here of Santa Fe fame. Uh, did a program on, on uh, Israeli settlements. How often do you hear something from one of your guests that opened your eyes? I mean, you, you, you've heard it all by now, right? Uh, I haven't heard it all. Uh, in fact, I was very um, interested to hear what Richard Wolff had to say uh, about the economy uh, three or four years ago, not just when he was here in September, but uh, just three or four years ago, he was telling the American people, essentially, you know, like uh, Cassandra, saying, if you don't pay attention to what's going on with the economy, with this incredible transfer of wealth, with this huge growth of inequality, with this, uh, you know, stupendous transfer of, of uh, you know, riches to the one percent at the expense, basically, of the ninety-nine percent, you will be sorry. There will be a price to pay, and we are paying that price today with unemployment, with foreclosures, with bankruptcies, with massive student debt, with massive credit card debt, and uh, basically an economy that's spiraling out of control. Uh, and a military industrial complex that goes on its merry way, as if there's no tomorrow, and as if there's no end to printing more and more money. Were there times where you think you, would, you wouldn't make it another year? I mean, 25 years in any business is phenomenal, but in an alternative media, I mean, especially with all the changes that are mm -hmm. happening now? Well, I think the biggest problem has been what's happened to National Public Radio. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've written a book about this, uh, particularly in the last uh, 10 or 12 years. But it actually started even further back uh, in the 90s during the Clinton period, period when uh, the right wing saw NPR as, as a huge threat and it wanted to tame it. It wanted to silence it if it could or to make it so innocuous and uh, flaccid that it would pose no kind of 
uh, political threat. And so alternative radio, which was once on in Boston, Chicago, uh, major network stations uh, all over the country, uh, have, has uh, been taken off all of those stations. So the audio reach that I had, let's say, in the 80s and 90s is less today. But because of word of mouth, because of the internet, uh, because of uh, some of the new media, uh, we, I've been able to sustain alternative radio. But it's a constant uh, uh, struggle. I've had great support, I'm very happy to say, uh, from the Lannan Foundation you know, in supporting uh, my work. I've had you know, support from other quarters as well, and particularly from all of these great people. I mean, these are, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a kind of electronic umbilical cord, you know, to, to link up with uh, these voices of, you know, people of, of tremendous clarity and wisdom and uh, moral courage. So for me to be, you know, a kid from East 87th Street in New York, you know, between New York and East End, you know, to be there with them for me is a, is a great privilege and I feel so, so fortunate uh, to do it and I'm gonna keep doing it. I, I'm, I'm energized by this work. I feel it's more important than ever before that independent voices be heard in long form, not these 30 second sound bites or eight second uh, sound bites, you know, when you get uh, to hear a dissonant voice and, and there's usually no context. Alternative radio is in a way very retro. It's a throwback to an era when radio was for serious listening, where you could talk about important public issues in, in all of their complexities and have a full hour devoted to issues of the economy, the environment, um, po of politics, and, and so on. It, it's a major, major accomplishment, and I just want to congratulate you again, and thank you for all of the amazing, uh, you've radicalized me, I know probably everyone in here feels the same, so I just want to say a major uh, congratulations and thank you, and uh, we, will, we can take some questions from the audience, but first Can we? I want to celebrate. All the